Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of season two of the How in the Health podcast. We're in for a real treat today as I got to sit down and talk with Greg Davidson. He is the founder of Davidson Prosthetics, and he has pioneered advancements in prosthetic feet and lower limb devices that are remarkable in what they enable his clients to do. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. And here we go. I'm here with Greg Davidson with Davidson Prosthetics, and I'm super excited for this conversation. Greg, thank you for being here on How in the Health. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I... I, It's always fun to talk about uh, stuff I'm interested in anyway. (laughs) Well, again, as I've as I've taken a little bit more of a deep dive into what you do, it is absolutely fascinating. And so this is awesome for me. And then for anybody who watches or listens, I think they're going to learn a lot from you and what you're doing. Um, And so the first question I really have for you is how would you explain what you do to somebody who isn't familiar with prosthetics and the fabrication of prosthetics? Um, So as a clinical prosthetist, I'm uh, in charge of, really the whole process of evaluating and fitting and fabricating and maintaining uh, the prosthetic solution. Uh, so, and um, personally, I, I've kind of specialized in legs, which uh, to, for me, there's enough to uh, learn and develop, you know, over my career where I'm, you know, finding myself learning as fast now as, as I've ever been learning. Um, so for me, that's, that's been my focus. And, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, someone that, you know, the, the industry is kind of divided uh, up a bit in terms of the, the, uh, delegation of work and, uh, in terms of the clinicians will actually be in charge of the, the, the evaluation and, um, management and fitting uh, of the prosthetic device. And then there are technicians that actually do the fabrication. Um, so that's, that's been uh, something that throughout my career, I've done all on my own. Um, and that for me has been, uh, I think very important to allow me to, um, be as creative as possible. So, yeah. Uh, how did you get into this? How did what was the catalyst to get you into prosthetics and developing the prosthetic devices? I would say I, I was very, very fortunate, um, just a very lucky um, uh, happening that you know, right when I was choosing my my classes in, in uh, at a community college, I ran into a guy who was doing uh, prosthetics and. It seemed, you know, like a very interesting thing. I get, you know, you get to build with your hands and, and uh, interface with patients and make cool stuff. And uh, as it turns out, there's a prosthetic program uh, at the University of Washington, which is uh, nearby. And uh, I was able to get right in and, and do that. At the time, it only required a, a, a two years of school prior to getting into the program, and then it graduated with a bachelor of science in prosthetics and orthotics. And now that's, um, it's since been uh, nationwide. I think it's, uh, uh, a mass master's programs now. So you graduate from a master's program. Wow. So another two years. So not and, and at the time it was very attractive to me because, you know, um, I, I, you know, I, I was like, wow, I only have to go to four years of school. That sounds awesome. So um, I, I feel a little sorry for uh, the students that have to go through the extra training, but there, I'm sure there's a reason for that. Yeah. And how long ago was that? I mean, how long have you been developing these and, and helping people? Uh, I, I graduated in 1995 um, and, and uh, been making blades as fast as I can ever since. Uh, so... Um, and it, you know, I'm, again, I'm finding that I'm learning, uh, and growing in, uh, my understanding of this, um, continually. So, uh, I think, um, uh, there, a lot of times when, uh, as, 
you know, as you progress in your career, um, you know, process may tend to kind of go more into management and, uh, you know, kind of step back a bit from, from, uh, so much active involvement. And, uh, for me, that's, that's not been uh, something I've chosen to do. So, so I'm, I, I plan to hopefully make, uh, keep making legs until I'm in my nineties. And that's really my goal is, is because it's something that is, uh, you know, just endlessly uh, challenging and fascinating to, to me at least. So Yeah. Well, and, and looking over kind of the work that you do, you mentioned the lower limbs. Is that anything below the, the pelvis? Is that anything below the knee kind of where, where do you focus on lower limb uh, prostheses? For, for me, um, I, I tend to, uh, I'll go up as high as a short above knee amputee. Um, but once it starts getting up into the kind of the hip area, um, I don't have the expertise to be comfortable in doing those. And so I refer those to guys that do a lot of them. And, uh, that's, that's a level at the hip that, uh, I, 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 think a lot of amputees just choose not to wear a leg because it's it's you know challenging to get right and maybe more uncomfortable than it's worth to them but i i do have uh uh, uh seen several uh processes have pretty amazing results in, in that realm so i refer those patients to those guys yeah. and kind of the same with arms uh you know, there's nowhere near as many arm amputees in my area compared to legs. And, uh, I just, even though I've done them, um, it's, I, I like to, uh, focus my time on, on, uh, you know, where my expertise is and I'll, I'll forward those guys to, to those experts. Cause that's an area that, um, it, it, uh, patients will benefit from, being fit with somebody that is uh, got a lot of experience and has good results. So, yeah. And I and looking over again, the videos on the site that we're going to show for people here. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell if they weren't wearing shorts, I wouldn't be able to tell that they're wearing any sort of a device, just the, their gait and their natural movements and they're walking, they're jogging, they're sprinting, they're stopping. It's unbelievable. And you, there's, there's a word, the words here, maximum potential spring length. So can you explain what that is and why, I mean, you're a pioneer in the industry in that specific, um, kind of field. So what is that for the, for us that don't know what that is? And then what, what is the ultimate goal with that? So about, about 10 years ago, um, I was, kind of at a stage in my career where I, I, at that point I had my own business and was getting to work with a lot of uh, soldiers and young veterans that, you know, had recently lost their limb. And, uh, you know, these, these guys are really highly motivated to, to want to get back as much function as possible. And so, um, you know, I was learning at the time uh, the importance of uh, the long spring the long carbon spring when it comes to running legs, because typically a running leg in the industry um, will be something that looks like a little C. So it's, it doesn't have, it's kind of meant to be men, mounted underneath the limb rather than up behind in the back, like you see in the Paralympic um, competitions. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I started learning how to do them where they're very long and mounted as high as possible to maximize that spring length. And, uh, you know, noticed immediately that there was a massive difference in performance. And so, and then those guys were, you know, you know, bugging me about, um, making something they could use for everyday use that had that magical feel of energy. Um, and, uh, and, and then I was kind of forced into doing it because I had a little kid that, uh, happened to come in when I was fitting running leg and, um, and, uh, so I threw together a, a little running leg for him on the spot, just out of some spare parts I had and that's all he'd wear. Uh, so I realized, um, you know, I had to come up with something that, uh, 
was a better functioning device for him so he could walk normally rather than kind of walk around on his tiptoe. So, um, because a, a running leg is not something that you would use for everyday use um, because it's difficult to walk uh, or even play sports in um, because just because of the, it's designed specifically for running. So coming up with a, the idea to utilize that long spring uh, in a device that can be used for everyday use was, was a, a big breakthrough for me and, and how I think about prosthetics and what's possible um, in that realm. So yeah, what are the, the uh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, and I've got one right here. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the camera shows it. Yeah. I don't know if I can back up enough, but so you can see how it's mounted uh, as high up as possible in the back. Um, and that, and that it fits inside the shoe and it has a bit of curve to the shape. And there are different versions I make that the curve has um, some effect on the performance of it. So like a straighter spring is going to, is going to feel differently than one that has a little more curve to it. Huh. Uh, because if you can imagine a C shape is going to, is going to um, compress a little sooner and more uh, effectively than a straight spring. So, wow. That's uh, awesome. And, and it looks like, so at some point that one had kind of a, a foot insert into a shoe. Um, it looks yeah. like there are some others where the actual pad or where it makes contact with the ground is kind of its own thing, right? So if they're, I don't know if it's sprinters or whatever else it would be, they aren't necessarily wearing a shoe with that. It's just making direct contact with the ground. Is that, is that the yeah, case? Yeah, so a sprinter is going to have spikes uh, on there, and it's just a single point of contact that is meant to be a little round so that as they're, uh, as they're pushing off, it, it doesn't release energy too quickly. So, so it uh, transfers energy at the appropriate time. With a prosthetic foot, um, you want it to fit into a shoe. Sometimes I'll make it with tread, but uh, you know, for specific activities, um, like you know, some especially veterans that get more than one leg, they may have they may choose to have something like that. They can use them on the beach or hunting or for specific activities where they don't want to have the weight of a shoe. Um, but mostly, I'm building it to go inside of a shoe to be used for everyday use um, in, in that way. So, and it looks like you also... Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. The, the, I, I would say, so what I found is, so if you look at... So this, this here is a, a typical prosthetic foot um, that uses a carbon spring. And so it's meant to be mounted underneath the socket. And so the length of the spring here, they're doing what they can to maximize that spring length, but also to be easy to use for a prosthesis. And these, this is actually a great little foot. I, I do plenty of them for above knee amputees. And, uh, and there are, you know, gosh, maybe, I don't even know, maybe a hundred different types of uh, feet that are available on the market. So this is just, just one of them, but nearly all of them, are meant to be mounted under the socket. So, um, but so what I found with that long spring is that it is just has a, a feeling of energy and life to it that uh, amputees will notice instantly. And once it's dialed in, they and they you know get to get used to that in their daily life. Um, I, I just don't see it's it's very very uncommon that anyone will want something else and is that at least in my experience is that spring supposed to get as close as possible to their other leg to matching the same energy return of the the natural leg or is it to be even better than the natural leg like what is the goal with that spring and energy return um it's never going to be as much because a carbon spring there's always some it's never going to return 100 percent of the energy um, I'm not sure the exact figure. I know they did a, some kind of study back in the Oscar Pistorius, um, you know, Olympic, um, uh, 
is that that situation where you know they needed to show that he wasn't getting an advantage and so and if there was i think it was maybe 86 percent of the energy is returned um but with muscles um you're generating 130 percent of energy in the calf muscle um so there's not an a there's not an advantage, um, but we're just trying to make with this long spring concept. I'm trying to make something that is maximizing as much as I can with the process with, with the spring, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and and not only does it give that feeling of, of life and energy, but it's extremely lightweight, um, and uh, it also has since it's connected directly to the socket there's you know um a lot of people will say that it, they get a little more sense of feeling from it because it's kind of transmitting ground contact vibration into the socket wow. so um and uh so yeah that's uh that's and that's uh, you know I've, I've fit uh 589 of these um over the last 10 years and uh so i i've been over the years just with each one you learn a little something and then you try to get better results with each each one you make and uh um and then also understanding the different types of human uh gait and the ranges on each end of the range uh that i see so uh so i'm even in the last year, uh, that's something that, you know, I'm, I, it seems obvious to me now, uh, but uh, like the ends of range from what I call a heel walker to a toe walker, um, those, those are going to require different types of spring stiffnesses and alignments to really get the most out of uh, the, the, the foot performance for that, that uh, way of walking. And, so. and that model that you showed that you, the, the full kind of leg model that you showed, is that kind of an all arounder? That's for people that want to wear that, like you said, that are going out just for a walk, but also that are participating in some sort of a sport, or is that kind of more of a specific functionality? And then they would have a different leg that is more for sprinting in a straight line. They'll have a different, a different device that's more for going out and just going about town, or is that kind of the one that you showed accomplish all of those? So that, that one is uh, ideally meant for everything. Um, it, it's not, if, if I work and working with someone who really is into running, then, then we'll do one specifically for running. But other than that, they can do everything. Um, and um, it's meant to, now, f- for example, the, the, the times that I end up doing like a more conventional style foot um, will be mainly for uh, women that need to have like a, a beautiful leg shape where it's got a skin on it and, and something that she can wear, um, you know, in dress clothes. And there are feet that have heel height adjustable uh, feet so that they can wear different shoes, which is important to women. Um, but many of them will also have uh, the long spring version as well. Yeah, I was so. going to say, on, it looks like some have, on that long spring version that you showed, are there instances where that is wrapped in some sort of a skin, or is it always exposed? So I, I do make, um, I, uh, and I've got, photo, actually just had a, a veteran here that I made a uh, cosmetic uh, shape for and, and cover uh, last week. Um, where it's, I, I make something that is meant to fill out the gap underneath the socket so the pants aren't floppy. And so that's, in, in, in some cases, we'll make a shell to, to go over that to just enhance the look of it. So there are lots of things you can do to, depending on what, what's important to the, uh, to the patient. So. Yeah, it looked like some had some sort of designs and stuff around theirs that they kind of wanted to customize if they're putting, I don't know, a decal or something on it as well. But Yeah, you can laminate whatever you want in, into a socket. A lot of times it's just shirts, you know, with a silk screen, you know, vinyl print. You can laminate in there and it 
is kind of makes the, you know, it's kind of like a tattoo or something where somebody wants to, to show that. So yeah. that's, that can be a lot of fun for people. So what do they weigh? Like, what is the weight of the thing that you showed the device that you showed? Uh, that one's, uh, this, this one's probably, uh, oh, a bit under three pounds. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe two and three quarter pounds. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, and there's most prosthetic sockets are just a hard carbon. Um, so of course that would be a little lighter that way. One of the things that, that I do is, uh, also make, a uh, a flexible inner socket that has some cushioning in it so that, and that's really important to allow, um, adjustment and over time because, just making a leg is, is, is not, um, the end of it, you know, over time, an amputee's limb is going to change and, uh, or they might get a, a sore or an inflamed area that, uh, that you need to be able to deal with. So it's very important for, for me and management of a lot of patients to be able to, when they, when they have an issue, they come in, I need to be able to, adjust that very quickly and easily. So, so that's, that's something that I've spent a lot of effort working on. Um, so yeah, maybe we um, can talk through that fitting process. So first off, who, who are your patients or your clients? Who, how do you typically, or how do they typically hear about you and how have they lost limbs or have, how have they had that happen? I would say most of the entities I work with, um, uh, um, I, I didn't start with, initially they come from other processes um they're and they're mostly referred from other amputees um i do get some from uh, a major hospital um up in seattle but uh, most of them come uh, just as referrals from other amputees um and uh so yeah most most amputees are um, lose their leg because they're sick. You know, it's, I can't remember the number, but it's like between 70 and 80% are, um, have lost their leg because of diabetes and neuropathy and insulation problems. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we see plenty of those, that type of amputee, but, um, I have a high percentage of, um, a younger, more active anti population. Um, now, I the, the the problem with the the diabetic condition is it is not something that is getting better. So yeah. um, it's very unfortunate that uh, that these people have to suffer that way. Um, and uh, so, uh, but. For for me, I, I am fortunate to work with a lot of very uh, young active amputees that have lost their leg in combat, or they've lost them from like a motorcycle accident or a car accident, or from cancer, or because they're born with a, a limb deficiency somehow. So that's the most of the people that I see. And then, so they hear about you, they reach out to you and then they ask for your help. So what does that fitting process look like? Are they all coming to you on site and then you're kind of matching up kind of what you would, their lengths, their widths, their, the weights of the the device. And then that actual socket, take us through kind of how that all works. So about a third of the entities that I work with, um, actually fly in, um, for prosthetic care. And most of those are young military veterans or, or soldiers, um, or just people that, that, uh, are motivated enough to get on a plane and, and come in. So, um, but, uh, so with a brand new amputee, um, after the surgery, it takes about six weeks typically for the limb to heal up enough, um, to be ready for weight bearing. And, uh, and, and at that time, the limb is quite, uh, swollen so um it the fitting process in the first six months um really the goal is you know get get people up and active again walking um but also to shrink the leg down to a manageable uh shape so 
it takes a number of uh, recastings and you know you know making uh, kind of temporary sockets uh, along that process. And I I tend to prefer to do you know kind of do more uh, more uh, fittings along that ways just to make sure that the experience for them is is as painless as possible. So and with a with a a lot of you know amputees when they're brand new they don't you know one of the concerns is they're worried that it's going to be painful and uh, um, the the way a prosthetic socket uh, works is it it matches the volume of the leg um, and the shape of the leg and, and weight kind of weight bearing areas but matching the volume is important because um, you can't really compress the fluid volume of, of a leg and the leg is essentially fluid in that way and you can stabilize it by based on the bony shape but uh, matching that volume is very important and if and if you get that right then they're not taking pressure on the end of the leg so um, you'd like to see pressure evenly everywhere um, in the over the limb so there are some amputation types that can tolerate some pressure at the end, like through the ankle, some called a signs amputation, and then also through the knee, they can tolerate some as well. So those are amputations that are, uh, the outcomes of those are um, um, quite good in terms of function because they have that added advantage. So That's amazing. It seems like if, if for the new amputee specifically, that is such a life changing event for them. Right. And so the mental state of that, of, will I be able to walk again? Will I be able to do the things that I love again? And to be able to come to someone like yourself and you give them that hope and you give them that reassurance that look, you will be able to play sports. I saw somewhere they're playing softball, they're running, they're hiking, all of those things. I feel like that mental state has to be, um, I don't know, I, if I was going through that, it would be frustrating to say the least, right? Um, and so for you to help them and walk them through that, and it sounds like it is a longer term process. It's not, okay, you've, you've had your leg amputated, it's healed, let's get you on this device that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. You have to kind of yeah. work through it as they progress and, and as their limbs and their body changes as well. Right, yeah. Um, and, you know, with with uh, social media and the internet, um, amputees can get connected to people, un, you know, unlike, you know, earlier in my career, th that wasn't a thing, really. So um, amputees have a pretty good, big advantage uh, in connection to, to what's possible. And, uh, and so, you know, they, they can not only share their their experience, but uh, and to help other amputees, but they can you know, benefit from, from that as well. And you know, each you know, uh, I would say maybe uh, uh, two uh, three quarters of the amputees I work with are below knee, and another quarter are above knee. So um, the below knee amputees, most of them, they can resume their active lifestyle right where they left off you know, and, and sometimes even become more active depending on, you know, sometimes guys will get into running or, or other sports just as a result of training and trying to recover. So, um, um, above the amputees, uh, have, you know, some more challenge or if you're double, you know, if you're double below or double above me, um, you know, it's, it's a completely different set of challenges, um, uh, but you can amputees can still uh, look forward to to you know having an active lifestyle. So that's and the technology available to us today is is uh, you know really um, you know makes it so that when when I have an amputee walking in the door, you know I I've got so much to offer um, and you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's exciting to me to to be able to, um, but, you know, it's not just hype. I can really help somebody, and that's that's something that you know I jump out of bed in the morning, uh, you know, 
way too early actually you know usually a, because i i i just get more and more excited the more i do it it just doesn't get old so yeah, that's amazing and and the amputees when when you're working with them and through this fitting process specifically i think back to if i've turned an ankle or if i've hurt one side of my one of my limbs and i kind of counteract that in a way that hurts my other side so as you're as you're fitting someone for a device and is that something that you're looking at as well as to make sure that it's not putting undue stress on the uh, opposite hip or the opposite leg or even on the it, the hip that is in line with the device take us through kind of that thought process yeah yeah you're you're trying to get things as symmetrical as you can and uh um you know the muscle strength may be quite different between both sides especially with the butt knee amputees where you're missing some of the stability that you would normally have in your hip. So they've got to just compensate and got to set the alignment to, to try to smooth that out as much as possible. So, but uh, yeah, ideally you're, you're trying to optimize them as much as you can. And um, you can do a lot with the alignment. Um, and then also just how the leg is tuned in terms of how it's moving. So, and you know, really the most important part of prosthesis is the socket fit. Um, getting that comfortable is, you know, it's, it's really the most important thing we can do. So, and then, uh, there are lots of different ways you can make a socket, shape a socket, uh, um, you know, for what that limb needs. So the fitting process really, um, is, for me figuring out how to make that socket for that particular person. And once I have that kind of nailed down, um, you know, going forward in the future, it becomes uh, a, a, a less, less difficult uh, thing because I've already kind of have an idea of what, what their limb needs and, and not just the shape of the socket, but also how we um, interface to the socket, how we suspend the leg, how we hold the leg off. So, and, and that's actually one of the uh, major technological advances that I saw personally coming out of school. Um, the the, uh, the baloney amputees would just put on a wool sock and then push into the leg and then hold the leg on with a sleeve that comes up on their thigh. Mm -hmm. And now um, it's in nearly every and um, so, uh, baloney amputee I work with, we are using a gel liner of some kind. So the gel provides a interface and protection for the skin. So that with a wool sock, you might get blisters if you if you walk for a couple miles, just because it becomes abrasive on the skin. Um, where a gel liner is is that layer of sheer force protection, so that you're not getting blistering, and you can hike for 50 miles if you want. And, and not get a blister. So as long as the socket is fitting well. With that so. socket, is that something where, are you taking a mold of the limb? How does that, how do you get that fit to be correct? Uh, so yeah, I do it by hand. So I'm wrapping um, the limb with some compression in the wrap and then molding it with my hands around the bony areas. And you can do that lots of different ways in terms of where the pressures are and how you're holding your hands. Um, and so throughout the fitting process, um, you know, if I see that the fit, that the first check socket I make, if it's needing to be adjusted too much, I'll recast and just do it in a different way um, based on what I'm seeing. Uh, so uh, that uh, that's very important. Um, you know, it's, it's always better to start over if you have to uh, make too many changes. So, and, uh, and that, that's especially important for these guys that fly in because I don't want to send them home with something that isn't as good as, as what it really should be. And uh, there are some new technologies in terms of uh, casting where um, uh, that, that are in the industry, like, there's a, something called an aqua cast where they will stand into a cylinder of, of water that has a bladder uh, so that it's 
it's allowing them to weight bear evenly throughout the leg. And that's, that's something I, I use on occasion, uh, depending on the limb shape. Um, so that's, that's a method that just gives me a, a different starting point to the, to the process. Um, and a lot of processes now are using uh, scanning devices where they don't even take a cast. They'll just scan the leg, the limb shape. And that's not something I, I do. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see myself using that uh, in my career, but I'm sure that there's processes that have, have good success with that. So, um, and, and I can see how, if you're trying to make, you know, sockets as fast as you can in a third world country or something where you don't have the time or resource to, to dedicate to each patient, then, then maybe that's something that would work well or for a process that doesn't have the hand skill um, to be able to, to, um, to make a, a good fitting socket with, you know, by, by using, you know, hand skills that you develop over, you know, doing thousands of legs. Then, um, so I, I think the industry is, is going to, you know, more digital where, you know, a, a process can take basically a picture of the leg and then have it sent to a central fabrication where they get back a, a fittable socket. That's, that's, uh, where the industry is going, I think, um, or, you know, they'll 3D print something that, that can be used um, in, in the future. So, but for me, um, I, I'll, I think I'll probably always do it by hand because then I can feel the leg and manipulate the tissue and feel where the bones are. And that's just what I'm comfortable with. Yeah. And more of kind of that custom fit to the, the structures of the leg rather than just the outside appearance is what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what does that timeline look like if they fly in and you're going to get them fit? Is that a week long process? Is that a day process? How long does it take to kind of dial in exactly what's that fit? Um, usually for like a, a, a baloney amputee that I've not fit before, I like to have three days with them. Um, I've done it as fast as a single day from the entire process. Uh, but I, I like to give myself a little more time than that. So, uh, and those are all amputees for the most part that have, um, limbs that are mature. So that, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend, uh, someone flying in that is brand new because the leg changes so fast. They, they'd have to be flying in every few weeks. Yeah. So what is, what does uh, the durability look like on, on these devices? Is it something that they, it will last their life? Is it something that needs to be readjusted every few years? How, what does that look like? So, uh, the warranty on feet typically is for three years. Um, but, and, and for an active amputee, you're going to for sure get that amount of time. Um, the, the types of feet that I, um, use have, they don't really have, um, a stress riser in the design because it's such a long spring. It's just, it's very, very strong. And uh, so I typically see those outlasting, you know, there, there's many of them that I made 10 years ago that are still working just fine. So um, most insurances will allow for coverage every three years for a foot. And then um, for a new socket as needed, you know, so, if the limb is changing in a significant way that you can't resolve with doing adjustments to the socket, then you can do a new fitting, um, as needed. So, yeah. Does that, does that, if somebody fluctuates in weight, if they gain weight, lose weight, is that something that's going to change that socket they need to yeah, get very, adjusted? Yeah, very much so. I mean, there's, you know, everyone, most people will, uh, change, you know, five, 10 pounds from summer to winter. And so, so having some way of uh, being, being able to adjust for that is important. Uh, um, you know, with the, you know, recent, uh, 
virus issue we've had, um, I've seen people come in that are 40, 50 pounds heavier than they were. And uh, yeah, for sure, you need to be starting all the way over and, and uh, you know, recasting at that point. Is it using so, the same spring and then you're just adjusting the socket itself or is it a whole new device? That's going yeah, on? usually we're able to just use the same spring as long as they're within uh, a safe weight for the leg. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So uh, these these long springs, I can replace the socket as many times as I want. It doesn't hurt it. So, mm-hmm. um, And same with, pros- with the typical prosthesis. Like, So this is this is a, a leg that is set up on a check socket. It's temporary. It's plastic, and it's reinforced so they can uh, they can actually take it and uh, you know test it out. Um, we would end up wrapping it with fiberglass at the top so they can take it home and, and try it safely. Um, and you can see this this is a these feet that have uh, that are mounted under the socket have a foot shell so it fits into a shoe. So, so, so it looks like that's probably about, I don't know, almost a foot that the actual limb is going into the socket. Does that change too? Will you have more shallow sockets, more deep sockets, depending on where on the limb they're needing this? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, in terms of the length of the limb, um, is that what you mean? Well, just the, the amount of the actual limb that's going into that socket. So the one you held up, it looked right. like it was a good size. I mean, the, a lot of the leg is going into that for security, I'm assuming, and to just make sure it's locked down. But does that right. vary much, or is it pretty much we need to get a certain amount of tissue into that socket for it to be stable? Um, yeah, so for below the knee, it's, uh, it's coming up just under the kneecap uh, for nearly all um, amputees. Um, and then and trim down in the back so that it has enough clearance to be able to bend the knee comfortably. So um, now if, if you're an ankle amputee or a signs amputee is what that's called, um, those can get away with a, a little shorter um, um, socket in terms of how high it has to come up. So, so yeah, the, it's dependent on the length of the leg to some degree. You don't want to short the socket too much because then uh, you'll lose stability and then you'll have tissue pressure problems um, that, that you have to manage if you're not doing your trim lines appropriately. So, And, then, and there's just so much variation in, in uh, <clears throat> what, what uh, you know, in, in the limbs that we have to, address that uh yeah there's there's not just one one typical common thing <laughs> so and and the thing that you're holding there the cushioning that goes inside of that socket um the first thing that comes to my mind is kind of sweat right like how do you deal with moisture whisking or does it get kind of is that something where it gets sweaty obviously and how how does the yeah. amputee maintain their maintain their device their prosthesis how do they is there a cleaning thing that goes involved with that? How, yeah. How does an amputee maintain their, their limb? So, um, some people will, if they're in a, you know, hot environment, like down South Texas and, you know, anywhere that's super, super hot where your whole body's sweating, your limb is going to sweat too. So uh, those guys will probably take the leg off a few times in the day and dry it off. So they don't have, you know, sweat pooling down in the bottom. Um, for some of those amputees, we'll utilize elevated vacuum in, this, in the, the, the socket design. And the benefit of that is that it pulls the sweat <clears throat> out of the socket, you know, up, up really up on the thigh where it's not troubling uh, to, to the limb. So uh, that's one way to do it. Some, some people will <clears throat> wear a sock that kind of wicks that up. Um, that's kind of more rare though. Some people will use, uh, like a antiperspirant on their leg. Um, that, that can be effective as well. Up here in Washington state, um, it's, it's not super hot. So the sweating is less of an issue here. Uh, so, 
And, to, and what about general maintenance, right? As you're sending them off with their new limb and their new device, are there things that they should be aware of, of, hey, don't do this, or you should do this, and just general care of the of the device? Well, with the, like the, the gel liners that, that I was talking about, so this is, it's like this is a this is a gel liner here. Um, it's a little thicker silicone gel at the bottom for cushion. Mm -hmm. This one has a, a pin for attachment, so it holds it into the leg, um, and then you know is stretchy up top. So this thing, um, it's important because this gel is right against the skin. They need to be able to keep that clean, because you can imagine, you know, even not cleaning it. <clears throat> if you're not cleaning it every day, you're going to run into problems with bacteria and fungus and, uh, you know, you know, give yourself a, a real problem with that. So uh, that, that's the most important uh, thing to maintain properly is keeping those clean. And uh, they'll, they'll have more than once that can rotate. Them. So um, as far as overall maintenance, the, the ones I make don't really need it so much, except uh, the prosthetic knees will need some some maintenance in, um, in terms of the, the prosthetic knees will tend to break down you know, where they need to get seals replaced. And, uh, you know, maybe some of the sensors uh, can can stop working. So that, that definitely is a maintenance issue. Um, and then also uh, amputees will need to have adjustments made to their socket shape, um, you know, you know, some of them more regularly than others. And they just uh, will typically come in, you know, whenever, whenever they need it and have that done. And because of how we design the, the leg with a flexible inner socket, we can take care of that really quickly, just a matter of minutes. So just because you have a good fitting socket when it's made doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. So you know, in, and, and, points this, of in, in this industry, go ahead, go ahead. what's that? Well, to our point earlier of weight, right? I mean, I, I've fluctuated in the last month in my weight. And so just, yeah. it seems like that would need something that you just make sure that there's probably a range that the socket can deal with, but at, at a certain point, they need to come and get that. Right. Adjusted. And, and usually, um, they'll have some way of adjusting for volume for limb volume, because even throughout the day, they will change their limb volume is going to change. You start up, start off in the morning and your leg is going to be a little larger because you haven't been weight bearing on it. And then at the end of the day, you know, it's going to be smaller. So uh, they'll have socks that they, they can use, put, they can put over the leg that will increase the volume. Um, so um, not everyone has to do that, but uh, with below knee amputees, they'll, they'll need to do that. Above knee amputees typically don't need to deal with any of that because the leg has got better circulation and uh, it's not maybe not as critical that they maintain such a, a perfect volume uh, maintenance. So interesting. And and talk me. We talked a little bit about insurance. You alluded to it. So are these covered by insurance? Is that kind of how amputees are able to pay for these, or how does that financing side of things look to get these made for them and then ultimately paid for? Yeah, nearly everyone is. Um, you using uh, health insurance of some kind. Um, so, and they'll pay for, you know, percentage of it. Most, most, you know, most of that. And these things are pretty expensive. So um, what is paid for is, is uh, you're paying for a product that is working for a reasonable amount of time. And so we, like, we don't charge for adjustments. And, and things of that nature um, because we want people to come in and not, you know, be worried about having to pay for, for adjustment of it. So, and the, the way the prices are determined is, um, is a strict adherence to Medicare uh, guidelines. So they have coding that, that, you know, the leg has to be, um, has to adhere to. So it's, it's not like we can charge whatever we want. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of how the whole industry is, is uh, um, positioned around. 
is the Medicare uh, guidelines. Yeah. So, and insurances will follow that as well. Hmm. So, and you know, we do uh, a lot of a lot of the work we do also is um, you know is things that, that we're donating, like um, like with Running Lakes, for example. Typically, uh, there are charities that donate the blade, and then we donate the <clears throat> the socket and the the, the build of that or someone doesn't have insurance, you know, we will uh, step in and help out with that. So it's not like there's people that are going, going without, uh, uh, it, you know, so pe- there are ways to get things covered. Yeah. So what are, in, is, is it all right if we ask this, what is kind of the range of the cost of these? Again, I know it's going to depend on what it goes into it and what kind of a setup that they need, but what is kind of the range that somebody could expect uh, a device to cost? Well, I, I'm kind of separated a bit in, in my business. That I've got my brother, Nathan, who's a clinical prosthetist, and he runs the business and deals with all that part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not aware uh, so much about the cost, but I would say for a below knee prosthesis, it, it range depending on what components you're using um you know from you know 10 15 20 thousand dollars so they're they're definitely not not cheap and above knee you're quite a bit more expensive because then you're you're dealing with a prosthetic knee which just the knee alone you know can be depending on what it is can be you know thirty thousand dollars so um so very expensive, and and even the percentage for for the percentage of copay in insurances can be something that is a hardship for people, and and uh, you know that's that's something that you know that uh, you know we try to help out with. Uh, so yeah, well, and again, for those who are watching, we can show it, but for those who are listening, we'll have in the show notes here, kind of to your side, and some of the videos that you have on there of again, they're able to get their life back in the sense of their mobility, right? So, so yeah, there is a cost to this, but when you look at the results of that, um, I don't know if I were an amputee to be able to walk, like I can see your, your clients walk and run and interact and do the things they do. I think, I think it's amazing. I think it's absolutely amazing to see. Yeah. And, um, even amputees that have more, um, severe challenge, you know, like, like with above knee amputees or, or double amputees, um, you know, I've, I've seen, um, I've seen, you know, guys lead incredibly active lives, even double up above knee. Um, and, and, uh, you know, very active, um, work, uh, lifestyle, uh, you know, where they're on their feet for, you know, 10, 15 hours a day. Um, so it, just because you, um, you lose your leg doesn't mean you can't have a normal life, you know, yeah. in, in, in many, many cases. So, and, and much of that has, has uh, a lot to do with the attitude, you know. Uh, so I think the people that are the most successful are, are the ones that are able to, you know, come to terms with the loss of limb and move on and not, not spend their life placing blame on how they lost it or what they've lost. You know, it's always a struggle, you know, to lose something, you know, or lose that, that part of you. But I think the people that do the best, you know, are able to get right back to work and right, get right back to their lives again, as fast as they can. So not, not let, um, that challenge, uh, you know, affect their life. Yeah. So, yeah, it looks like, uh, again, a couple on your website there with, they're playing softball with their double amputee and they're playing softball, which I think is yeah. unbelievable. Both the hitting, the fielding, the throw, all of that stuff is, it's remarkable to see. And then the Olympic athletes or anything else that, that, that are going on. And like, what, how does that feel like? What are those success stories for you? of is it I get them from 
point A to regular life or I get them to accomplish goals that they even haven't be accomplished before the loss of limb? Well, one of the things that I like to do at my shop is, you know, have pictures everywhere and then have uh, amputees um, be, <clears throat> be able to interact with other amputees that are being fitted at the same time. So that every time you come in, you're always meeting somebody new and seeing what other people are doing and realizing, hey, you know, my life is not really going to change like maybe I thought it was. You know, I, I, I can still be as active as, as, uh, as I should be, you know. So it's not just because you've lost a limb, it doesn't mean you've got an excuse to, to just sit in a chair for the rest of your life and not progress you know, some, some people have to, of course, but, um, I, you know, try to encourage people to, to not have that outlook. You know, I would say, um, you know, sometimes being able to see someone that has much harder challenges than you do kind of brings a perspective that is really important. Um, you know, so if, if you see someone that, that has, now, you know, someone that has two limbs missing or, you know, yeah. or more, you know, that's, um, and that they're not, they're not, uh, they're still able to be, have a joyous life. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's important. So. Yeah. One of my saw was even just a mother, right? She, I think the story she had gotten, um, a non-cancerous tumor and her leg had to be amputated. And then she was able to come to you and get get a, a limb, a lower leg limb, and, and now she can still interact with her children, right? And run around and chase her kids and, and kind of yeah. interact with them in that way. Just just the, I guess, I would call it the mund mundane life, but it's just your regular, your regular life aspects that you just don't really recognize or realize or take for granted until until you lose yeah. that. But now she can run around and chase kids and yeah, push most yeah. So I think that's that's awesome. Again, there's obviously the athletic part or the act, active lifestyle, but just the the regular aspects of life, I think, are really important for people to to enjoy as well. Right. Yeah. And uh, and again, the, um, there is such a range of challenge throughout. Uh, you know, just lower limb amputees that you know it's hard to just <clears throat> you know say it's hard to say that uh well one person's challenge is definitely going to be more than than someone else you know that you know like like with i work with uh with an apt that is missing both legs above the knee he's he's I, I hope when i'm his age i'm as active as he is yeah. um but he he always you know he sees the other amputees that come in and he's like oh what do you have to complain about, <laughs> he says, "I trade right now with you." <laughs> uh, so every, everyone's got their own challenge, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it, I I would say that you know, and it's just to be in a place where I get to work on a daily basis with these people is is um, you know, I can't imagine doing something that's that's more exciting, yeah. at least for me. So. No, that's that's remarkable. What what resources are there for out there for people who want to learn more about this? Again, whether that's themselves who've recently gone through an amputation or a family member on how to best support an amputee. What resources are out there for people to learn more about this? So there's the Amputee Coalition, which is I think the largest um, organization um, where you can get plugged into uh, support groups in your area. Um, you know, so that's, that'd probably be the place to start. And then, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of Facebook groups that are, that are set up, you know, and social media groups where, where you can actually, um, you know, meet other people that have the same challenges. Um, uh, so. Oh, that's great. And, and, I think it's, again, I've said this multiple times here. I think it's remarkable what you do. I think it's remarkable to see and read and watch the, the people that you've been able to help and learn their stories. So huge props to you for, for doing all of that. And is there anything that I haven't asked that I should have when it comes to 
how you're able to help people in the prosthetics field? I would say, for example, that uh, anyone that's interested in doing prosthetics for a career, that it is not for everyone. And, and uh, I, I get to work with a lot of very you know, very exciting amputees in terms of their ability level and their motivation. Um, but most amputees, like we were saying before, are more at the end of their life and they're, they're you know, hampered by illness and uh, have challenges that are, um, you know, make it so they, they can't really become very active. Um, and, and so... Uh, what I get to do maybe doesn't represent what most processes will ever be able to do. Um, so, um, yeah, they, if, if someone wants to get into this, they, they probably should visit several different prosthetic uh, companies and, you know, maybe get a better idea of, of what they're getting into. Um, and that, you know, on a daily basis, you're, you're spending your day, you know, solving problems all day. You know, people come in the door and they've got serious problems and it's your job to find solutions. And uh, it's, it doesn't matter how nice of a person you are. If you can't find a solution for someone, uh, you know, you've, you know, you've not been successful. So, yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, for me, um, being able to have my hands in the process the whole way through where I'm doing the fabrication myself. Um, to me, that's, that's very, very important and something I, that I don't really want to uh, give up uh, because I can spend that time thinking about how to make, you know, to make sure that the, the final device is really um, best designed and built for that individual. So, and then, you know, just like with anything, um, you know, you need, you need thousands and thousands of hours at something to really become a master at it. And, uh, if I was to never spend a lot of time building legs, then how could I really know how to use the materials or teach somebody how to, how to do all that? So, and it seems like a pretty specialized field, right? I, I mean, the universities that I went to, I didn't ever notice that they had any sort of a degree or an area around that. So it sounds like, are there certain, yeah. are there certain universities or areas of the country where it seems to be more of a, has more of a foothold in terms of the education side of it? Um, well, here at the University of Washington, um, you know, I, I think they're probably one of the better um programs. I know Chicago has Northwestern University and um, there, there are many, there's probably a dozen or more other prosthetic schools. Uh, um, and, and I know that, uh, you know, with the um, baby boomer generation getting in, you know, becoming older, processes are going to be more and more in demand um, or just have to see more and more patients. And, and, uh, so it, most process will spend uh, most of their time doing paperwork and doing management in, in that way. Um, and for me, I've, I've got help with that. So I don't really have to spend much time at all um, with that stuff. And that's, that's the reason why I, I'm, I want to keep doing this as long as I possibly can. If I had to do paperwork all day, I, I'd be looking to retire. So. <laughs> That's just me, though. Well, that's a good point, though. Is like let, you're you're a master at what you do, so spend your time doing what you're great at, right. and and hopefully the other people in your support team can take care of the rest. So. Right, and then a lot of uh, I, I have students from the local prosthetic program that you know come out one day a week um, just to you know see what I'm doing, and uh, a lot of them will ask how they can get to work with you know, all these active amputees and, uh, you know, I, I tell them that, 
you know, you have to be able to offer your your amputees something they can't get anywhere else. You know, you have to develop your own abilities to the level that that will attract those people. You know, because uh, especially now, amputees can can meet people online um, <clears throat> and learn from them. And you know, if they're struggling with with uh, their prosthetic um, care where they're at, they're going to go and find uh, where you know a place that will take care of that. Yeah. There's a lot of amputees that end up getting frustrated. Um, so um, yeah, so. And then also learning how to do running legs is something that every prosthetist should know how to do. And you can do that by working with, if you have kids, you can get, uh, pros you can get, uh, charities to donate, uh, running springs, even with adults, you can get through the challenge athletes foundation. They'll donate a spring to anyone that asks. So, um, if somebody wants to run, there's no excuse. You can, you can get them running. So, and, and the never say never foundation is another, great charity for kids and athletes. So that's awesome. I think yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in what you shared too, right? Of just how do you differentiate yourself because people have problems and can you solve them? And if you can, then you'll have, you'll have work. Right. And if you can, yeah. Then yeah. And, and in this industry, I find that, you know, you don't get paid for everything you do. You're doing a lot of, you're doing a lot of extra stuff and, um, you're having to redo projects because for whatever reason, it didn't, it didn't, uh, turn out. Uh, and you have to redo the socket or redo, redo everything. Um, and, um, I think for me having the perspective of seeing each patient and, the, you know, as a lifetime of care so that it doesn't matter so much what I have to do to, get them functional, you know, it's worth it because you want to take care of somebody over their lifetime, yeah. you know, and, and that perspective I think gets lost with a lot of big business, which is, uh, it's kind of un unfortunate as, you know, companies try to cut costs and, um, because, because things become more expensive and, uh, less reimbursement over time. Yeah. So, no, that makes sense. And we've talked with a couple of physicians and, and things around that, right, is that the reimbursements go lower and lower because, look, it's become less and less expensive or more and more efficient. And it's like, well, that's come from the last 10 years. Like, that's that's experience that has contributed to that. It's not just like, oh, it's magically cheaper. It's it's that expertise and that the fact that you've done so many different devices that now you can kind of work your way through things quicker and get it to be more precise yeah. The reimbursement has to come to that too, right? The experience part of it, not just, oh yeah, it, it was turned out quicker than before, right? So Yeah. Yeah, we're we're not paid paid based on how quick it takes to make it, you know. So uh you're you're paid based on something that is uh up to the standard. Uh mm -hmm. and if you're faster then that's great. But sometimes it takes a whole lot of extra effort. You know, uh, and uh, that's just part of the process. And and there's enough there's enough easy ones out there where it all kind of evens out. Yeah. And I, I've I've I don't even like to know much about <clears throat> the financial part of my business because I don't like to think about it. Um, I have enough trouble staying asleep that I need to just focus on uh, you know the things that that I that I, I'm good at, I guess. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, Greg, you've been, you've been fantastic. I have three really quick getting to know you questions if you're willing. Sure. And they're kind of, uh, kind of related, but the first one we're going to ask is, do you have any passion projects outside of this, outside of what you do? Well, <laughs> um, there are things I enjoy doing, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I enjoy, um, sailing and getting out outdoors and hiking and uh, spending time with my wife is which is kind of what what i do when i'm not working yeah so um th there are uh there are some things that that i would like to be involved in more like um you know um 
I'm planning on going down to the Center for the Intrepid in a, maybe every, every year to do some teaching and fitting down there with, down in uh, San Antonio uh, with, with these soldiers and veterans down there. Uh, because that, I think, is really important as I get older. I, I don't want things that I've developed to, to die with me, you know. And, and uh, being able to pass that on and, you know, being involved with other processes that, you know, where I get to share with them and they get to share with me, I think that's, that's something that is going to be important going forward for the rest of my career. Awesome. So. That's awesome. All right, question number two, if you're ready for it. Sure. You, you have the world's attention for one minute what is the message that you would share with the world? It doesn't have to necessarily be you, but what is the message that you would want shared with the world if you had the world's attention for one minute? You know, you know, the things that we see going on in the world today, um, you know, makes our day-to-day lives seem awfully easy. And, uh, you know, I wish that, you know, I, I see so many uh, young men and, and, uh, and women, you know, have to deal with injuries that come from war. And, uh, you know, I, I know there's always, there's always evil in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, strong men and women have to stand up against it. And uh, I wish that they didn't have to, but I'm so thankful for um, people that have sacrificed in that way. And, uh, you know, I don't want to see bad things happen, but there is evil in the world that, uh, that we have to stand up to. And, uh, thank goodness for those people that do and, and for the history that we have in our nation. Um, you know, the World War II generation, uh, we get to have a free, country and uh, the ability to do the things that we want to do so yeah. no that's great that's great it's huge thanks to to those who make it so that we can live comfortable lives because not everybody gets those opportunities yeah. um all right last one is what is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen well i i live in a beautiful part of the world so lots of different places i could say but honestly other than my wife and son, um, I would say the most beautiful thing is those, I can think of a few times in my career that just stick out like, you know, I'll, I'll remember for the rest of my life where you get, you see that look on somebody's face where they've, you know, uh, of emotion where, they can see that their life is always is going to get better and um, that that kind of experience is uh is, you just can't forget that and it, and it's and it makes all the hard uh hard times worth it you know so no that's awesome greg thank you so much for taking the time that you have again i know you're a busy man i know you're helping a lot of people I can, I think I can speak for everybody that you have helped and saying thank you for, for the effort and the attention that you put into what you do and for sharing that with us. So for those listening, Davidson prosthetics, we'll have links to it, but Greg, again, I I can't thank you enough for doing this. So my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. You have a good rest of your day. All right. You too. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more episodes like this where we talk with healthcare leaders, be sure to subscribe and stay up to date with our most current episodes. Thanks again for listening.